Hello and welcome to the CircuitPython Weekly for March 1st, 2021. Uh, this is the time of the week where we get together to talk all things CircuitPython. So I'm Scott and I work for Adafruit on CircuitPython. Uh, CircuitPython is a version of microcontrollers, a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, many of us who work on CircuitPython are sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython by extension, consider per consider purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting happens every week on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join any time by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. It usually happens at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. If the meeting time has changed, we'll notify you via Discord. If you wish to be notified about the changes about to the meeting, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPython Easter's role as well. Uh, there's also a calendar available that we try to keep updated if you'd like to subscribe to that. Um, this meeting is recorded. We record audio from the voice channel and the video of the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you are still welcome to participate. Just add notes to the notes doc, and I'll read those off. Um, the video of this meeting will be posted to YouTube, and the audio is released as a podcast. If you find this podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, please let us know. Uh, there's a notes doc to accompany the meeting and the recording. If you wish to participate it, uh, but can't make to the meeting, you can always leave uh, notes in there, and I'll read them off. Um, the document includes timestamps to go along with the video slash audio so that you can skip uh, into the different bits of there. Meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, depending on how many folks we have and how many topics we have to cover. Um, a link to the notes doc is posted in the CircuitPython channel every week uh, for the, the next week's version, so it should be available for a full week. Uh, check the pin messages at the top. Uh, so this meeting is held in five parts. First is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. Uh, the second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look up the project by numbers, separate from kind of what we're all up to and how we feel about it. Uh, the third part is hug reports. It's an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. Fourth, uh, and that hug reports is done as a round robin, uh, which we've talked about before the meeting has started. Uh, the status updates is another round robin. It's an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to, talking, uh, taking a couple minutes to talk about what we've been working on, what we plan on working on in the coming week. Lastly, in the weeds, we uh, the fifth, the last part is in the weeds where we have an opportunity for any longer form discussions. Uh, to add topics there, please add those to the notes doc ahead of time. And that's how the meeting go will go. So first up, uh, we will... I'll talk about community news. So first up on community news, uh, we reached 70 single board computers supported by uh, Blinka, which provides uh, a, a base layer for uh, CircuitPython libraries on Linux single board computers. It is a pip installable Python library that runs a normal desktop Python. One can port their microcontroller to an SBC or vice versa. Uh, Blinker reached a milestone this week. It now supports 70 different single board computers. So shout out to maker Melissa for leading that effort. Um, next up. Uh, if you didn't know, we have a CircuitPython subreddit. Uh, the CircuitPython subreddit uh, on reddit.com crossed the 2000 member mark. Uh, thank you to all our Reddit readers for choosing to get your Python fix on our subreddit. And also a huge thank you to Anne B who uh, posts all the content there and really runs the, the subreddit. So thank you to Anne. Um, the Python developer surveys for 2020, uh, the results have been released. So the Python Software Foundation are excited to share the results of the fourth official Python developer survey conducted with the help of JetBrains. More than 28,000 Python users from almost 200 countries took part in the survey this past October. With the help of the data collected, they are able to present the summarized results, identify the latest trends, and create a Python developer profile. Uh, links there to the Python Software Foundation's announcement, along with the JetBrains one as well. Um, and lastly, um, happy birthday to Raspberry Pi, which turned nine. The original Raspberry Pi launched on February 29th, 2012, making this low-cost single-board computer nine years old. It really does, doesn't does seem that long ago. 
Uh, with 38 million units sold, the Raspberry Pi powers a huge community of makers, students, and businesses. What started as a small project meant to increase applications for Cambridge University's computer science program has become a global movement. Uh, and there's a link to a Tom's Hardware article about it. And uh, as always, the cir- this is a preview of the CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter, which is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday morning. The archives are available at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. Uh, it is developed in the open, so to contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub. The repository is github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython dash weekly dash newsletter. There's a drafts folder in there, and you'll see the latest draft in there. Uh, you can submit a pull request uh, with changes, or you can tag a tweet with, on, with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter, or email cpnews at adafruit.com. Uh, and that includes uh, projects and stuff that you've been working on, so we want to hear about all of it. So thank you to Anne and Katney for putting the newsletter together. And next up, we're on a roll. Uh, State of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is kind of an objective overview of the health of these our like broad project and the sub projects themselves it's meant to kind of balance our how do we feel about how everything's going with actually some numbers so uh first up i'll talk about numbers overall um so overall we had 12, 27 pull requests merged from 19 different authors it's where, you know, we're hitting right around that 20 mark every week, which is amazing. Um, some new names in here that I don't really recognize. Biffo Bear is one of them. Um, Adam Candy is another. A-N-H-M-I-U-H-V. I don't know how to pronounce that. And R. Rotman are all new names. So thank you to our new authors. Uh, we had nine reviewers. Uh, thank you to all nine reviewers. As always, we're looking for more reviewers because they help us scale about scale out the number of authors that we have. Issues wise, overall, we had 23 co- closed issues by 14 people and 25 opened by 22 people. So again, a lot of people are involved. We're about net zero um, in terms of open and closed issues. So overall, things are going pretty well. For the core, which is like the C Python core of CircuitPython that loads onto microcontrollers, we had four pull requests merged from four different authors and two reviewers, so thank you to everyone there. We had 26 open pull requests, which is kind of a lot, uh, but we'll have to take a look at those. Uh, generally, generally, we uh, do tend to get a lot of them done early on in the week. Uh, Issues-wise, we had five closed issues by five people and seven open by six people, so we're uh, net up two issues for a total of 410 open issues. We have seven active milestones. Um, this is the way that we keep track of like which issues we've triaged and uh, kind of what the priority is for them. Uh, we have five issues not assigned to milestones, so we'll have to take a look at those. Um, we've got 11 open issues for 6.2, and we have 42 open issues for 6xx. And I, I think generally for 6.0, we're, we're going to have to take a, a glance through all of those um, Oh, all of those issues to, to reprioritize them. I think generally we want uh, fewer in those categories. Um, so overall, I think uh, 6.2 is, is rapidly approaching. Um, there's a lot of really good stuff for the RP2040 and some reliability stuff for the S2 that will go in that. And I think um, it's likely to be the last kind of sub-release of 6, um, unless... Otherwise, we'll probably move on to developing seven at that point. Um, and seven, there's seven open issues that are, are related to being able to change things up for 7.0. Um, so I, I kind of expect we'll do a 6.0 stable and then move on to seven. So <laughs> thank you to Jeff for trying to capture my rambling in the notes. And with that, uh, let's hand it over to Katni for a library update. Thanks, Scott. Mm-hmm. So this applies to all of the Adafruit Circuit Python libraries and a couple of extra things such as our cookie cutter and our community bundle. Um, 
there were over all of those repos 20 pull requests merged from 14 different authors and eight different reviewers thank you to all our authors and all of our reviewers the oldest uh, pr that we merged was 41 days old um there are four of them that are over two weeks which is excellent a lot of them that are new um both of those uh, statistics are important because it means we're getting through some of the older PRs, but it also means that we're keeping up with what we have uh, coming in. We had, uh, that leaves us with uh, 55 open pull requests, um, which is an increase, um, but that's fine. <laughs> uh, we had 18 closed issues by 10 people and 14 opened by 12 people, leaving us with 286 open issues. Again, that's across all of those repos. And we have seven good first issues. Um, if you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side, go to circuitpython.org slash contributing. You will find all of this information and more, uh, including all of the open PRs, all of the open issues, and a list of library infrastructure issues. And you can search the issues by label. If you're new to all of this and you'd like something that uh, is simple to start with, try good first issue. If you're looking for something a little more complicated, uh, try bug or enhancement. Um, you can also just do a find in the page and and if you have a sensor and you want to see whether there are any bugs uh, available for that, you can do that as well. Um, there is a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. So you, uh, you're not alone there and we are always available to answer questions. We want you to be able to contribute in a way that works for you. Um, so if you're new to all of it, don't let that intimidate you. We are here to help. Um, and we have a fairly lengthy list, not relatively speaking, but a sizable list of updated libraries and no new libraries this week. Um, in terms of all of the libraries, uh, we had a situation where PyLint was updated and um, a previously existing check that wasn't working started working. And the way that we do examples in our libraries means that there are many libraries with examples that have very similar code. Because with CircuitPython, often the list of imports and the hardware setup is the same, even though the rest of the example may do something entirely different. And so we wanted to make sure that this, this check, which checks for duplicate code, was still running on the libraries because it's an important check, but we wanted to make sure it stopped running on the examples because of the way that the examples are written. It's, it's appropriate that they have duplicate code. So all of that said, um, we now have PyLint running in a different way and uh, it works with the way that we have our examples and with that duplicate code check. Um, but we are waiting on uh, the patch to be applied to all of the libraries. So for those of you who are submitting PRs and finding that they're failing on code that you didn't touch, um, I greatly appreciate your patience. Please let us know um, if you're comfortable with it. I can actually walk you through making the changes manually um, or help you with it or do it myself um, to get that library ready for your PR. Um, so I just want to let everybody know if you have outstanding PRs and you're, and you're running into that, uh, we do have a solution on the way um, that we can do sooner rather than later if necessary. Um, but other than that, everything else is pretty solid. We've had a lot of development on all the libraries and it's really been great to see. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katni. All right, next up we have a Blink update from maker Melissa. Hello. Let's see. Oh, the thing moved on me here. <laughs> yep, we're adding uh, too much stuff. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, for Blue Circuit Python, Raspberry Pi single. Hey, Melissa, Please? your audio is messed up. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's chopping in uh, and out. Okay, uh, your computer could read notes off. I'll read them. I'll read them off. Thank you. Mm hmm. All right, so for Blinka, we they we had three pull requests merged from two different authors. Uh, the person I definitely cannot pronounce, A N H M I U H V, and Maker Melissa. So thank you to our authors, two reviewers as well. So thank you to to the reviewers. 
There are four open pull requests. A couple very long, uh, been open for a while, but two others that are a lot less. Uh, <laughs> Uh, issues wise, there were zero closed issues by zero people, four open by four people, uh, for a total of 56 open issues. If you want to check those out, you can go to github.com slash Adafruit slash Adafruit Blinka slash issues. Uh, PyPI downloads in the last week is 1,452 along with, uh, now 70 supported boards. So that's the Blinka update. <laughs> Next up, we have Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance for us to say thank you to folks for the work that they've been doing. Uh, it's done as a round robin. I will start and go through the list. If you do want to participate in the round robin, please make sure that you have at least your username in the notes, if not uh, some notes as well. Um, we'll. Say that you're lurking or unable to attend along with your name if you need me to read them off uh, so that I do that and not just wait for you. Okay, and with that, uh, first, uh, hug report to Microdev for taking on the 1.14 merge. Um, you are at an NVM for the RP2040. Microdev has been doing a lot of awesome work, and the 1.14 merge is a huge task. Um, so I'm excited to see that. Uh, thank you to Foamy Guy for the streams every week. If folks don't realize it, Foamy Guy has been streaming regularly on Saturdays. I caught some of the stream this week, and it was exciting to watch. Uh, very excited for that. So thank you, Foamy Guy, for doing those streams. Um, hug report to June to Sack for working on the NRF52 sleep stuff. Uh, hug report to Omsai for helping with the ninja build thoughts. Uh, we talked a bit about it on my stream on Friday, and I noticed that they went and added some notes to the like issue for, for brainstorming there. So that's been super helpful. So thank you to them. Um, thank you to Endico for helping folks on the discord i went back and looked at everything and they were being really helpful and and a new person to the community i don't don't want to uh discount all the awesome other folks so just thank you everyone for being so awesome um this community has been growing like crazy in the last year in particular uh those of you who've joined in the last year you welcome you've been amazing um and then those of you who previously as well uh, thank you for helping us grow and uh, continue to be the awesome community even as we grow. I think it can be really challenging to kind of keep the ethos. So all of you are a part of that, and I really appreciate it. Um, I don't do group hugs that often, so consider that a group hug. Uh, next up, we have notes from TG Techie, uh, who's unable to attend. Uh, hug report Jerry N for helping debug the LC709203F and NRF52840 issues. Uh, hug report to Kmatch98 for the continuing streams and the community community hug. With that, I'll hand it over to V923Z. Uh, thanks, Scott. <clears throat> so um, beyond the group hug, I would like to single out two people. Uh, that's probably an oxymoron. But anyway, um, first, uh, Dan, for bringing up a, a subtle issue um, uh, with regards to the buffer protocol. I, I removed the function in the microlab um, C uh, code, thinking that it's not, not really required because there was an explicit version of that but uh then pointed out that that's that's actually quite important so thanks for that and um i would like to thank jeff for actually fixing the bug and um or or reintroducing the function and um uh, uh, lending me a, a helping hand with with quite a few bug fixes and and integration issues so thanks a lot jeff thank you Zoltan. And also, I should say, the, one of the reasons to go to 7 is that we can move to the mainline or something of uh, Microlab, so we don't have to keep maintaining two versions. So it's another reason for us to kind of move into the 7 zone, so to speak. All right. Uh, next up is Dan. Hello. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, new uh, contributor, Jun Tusak, who has been working on uh, light and deep sleep for the NR NRF52. They have an application for it themselves, but have really jumped in uh, feet first, uh, trying to understand a lot of code that's very hard to understand about how, how sleep works, which is complicated. Mm -hmm. So thanks for the PR and thanks for continuing to work on it. It should be done fairly soon. 
Um, thanks to Scott for reviewing um, a fix. I have a fix for RP, the RP2040 digital in out, but I've like revised it like three times because each time I make it, I forget another corner case. And so Scott pointed that out and it's in review again. Uh, thanks to Lucian for a uh, discussion on uh, ESP32 S2 I2C problems uh, with or without Wi Fi, but I understand where he got to in his debugging so far. And then thanks also to Jeff for a discussion um, on Sunday about um, ideas I had had kind of waking up early in the morning kind of ideas about how we might speed up translation builds and change the way translations are built so that there's less work done. And that's still, it's a long-term thing, but uh, thanks for talking to me about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome, thanks, Dan. Uh, next up, we have notes from David Glaub, uh, who says, lurking, sorry for the long list. Don't apologize for a long list of hug reports. Hug reports are awesome. Um, okay, so first up, Hug Reports, Katney and Carter for the SCD30 CO2 sensor guides. Hug Report, hug report to myself, Tan Newt, for the audio stuff on the RP2040 and helping out on Discord. Hug Report to Todd Kurt it, on Twitter, Toddbot, for the rotary encoder on the Cutie Pie idea. Hug Report to Joey, uh, Jose Castillo on Twitter for making me want to have a Casio F not, F91W. Uh, hug report to Liz Clark, aka Blitz City DIY, for MIDI learn guides. Surely one of those will be useful. Hug report to GWiz for wanting to start an ENUK translation. Uh, hug report to Microdev for your on the RP2040, and a hug report to Kmatch98 for finding an issue for finding a fix for an issue I raised more than a year ago about uh, the bitmap saver library. And next up, we have Foamy Guy. Alrighty, thanks, Scott. Um, this week hugs uh, one to Naradoc uh, for offering folks lots of great help on the Discord in the Help With channel. Um, hugs to uh, Jose uh, or Jay Podesta 2020 on GitHub um, for catching an issue with Tile Grid, uh, the way that we worked on inverting the XY uh, for the vertical text that Jose was working on last week. Um, caught an issue with ESP32 S2, and then uh, also shout out related to Dan H, um, Deshipu, Microdev, and GitHub user RSBone12 all looked into that issue and offered up solutions or testing or other various things. So I appreciate um, all of those folks. And uh, then lastly, uh, anybody who checked out my streams over the weekend, and uh, especially Hugo and anyone else who pointed out uh, a couple areas where I could improve. I had some broken links and descriptions, and the volume was a little off. I definitely appreciate uh, folks pointing that stuff out so I can try to get better. Uh, and that's all for me this week. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Filming Guy. Uh, next up is Higher Effects. All righty. Uh, thanks this week to Dan for uh, the low power um, discussion. We had a little trade off of I squared C versus low power stuff. And I uh, appreciate him filling me in because low power is complex. And on that note, also a thank you to Jim to Zach, um, who, as Dan noted, has been taking on the NRF low power. And uh, having gotten into that, the, the the work that they've done on that is uh, really pretty great. So um, very, it's a lot of work. So uh, <laughs> thanks to them. And then a group hug to the community. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, next up is Hugo. Are you set up with, there you go. Oh, yeah, I different, push the talk button on different computer. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. So first is thanks to Katni and Ask Patrick W for the feedback on the cookie cutter fixes I made. And next one guy for the uh, discussion on how to handle the progress and the value variations there for the progress bars. Finally, phone guy, um, Jose David and Kim Ash, uh during uh, phone guy's stream about uh, just how we can handle streams and different options for handling tabs in those streams for Awesome. Thank you, Hugo. All right, next up is Jeff Blur. 
Hello, I just got to find my place in the dock real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a bunch today. I want to thank Katni, Hugo, Dylan, and probably some others for jumping in to deal with the pilot updates that Katni was talking about earlier. Uh, Crayola and I had a nice chat about LEDs and more, and it was just fun to hang out with her. Uh, I wanted to thank Deshipu for speculating about a mystery board. There's a blog I read, and every month uh, a picture of a PCB is posted, and people are invited to guess what it is. Uh, to Maker Melissa, congratulations on getting that milestone of 70 boards in Blinka. Scott, uh, happy to see you adopting this new way of tracking participants in the meeting. Um, I agitated for that, and we're doing it, so that's great. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank Dan back for the informative chat over the weekend. Dan said, you know, do you have a minute to chat? And I'm pretty sure we were there for at least 90 minutes, but it was a well-spent 90 minutes and just nice to hang out with my colleague. So uh, yeah, thank you for all of that. Awesome, next up is Jerry. Uh, hi, um, See, uh, thanks to MicroDev and, and you, Scott, for all the, the work on getting the uh, UART working for the RP2040. Nice to have it. Awesome, thank you for so testing, it. testing it. All right, oh, next up is Katni. <laughs> All right, uh, so hug report to Anne for working with me on learning how to take over the newsletter. That's probably going to be a fairly common hug report for the next X amount of time. Um, to Dylan for working on patching the libraries to get the pilot update taken care of. To Hugo for sorting out getting pilot to run as we needed it to on the libraries. Um, a general hug report to everyone who has PRs in that are currently failing due to the latest update. Thank you for your patience while we sorted out the right solution to this issue. And uh, finally, a hug to Foamy Guy for submitting his stream to the newsletter via PR. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. All right. Next up is KMAS98. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I have to correct a misdirected hug from TG Techie this week. Uh, but I'd gladly take it and pass it to Foamy Guy for the live streams. So thanks, mm -hmm. Foamy Guy, for that. Uh, Scott, thanks to you, uh, Mark Gamblor, and Dan for helping add a new module and giving me good examples to follow for, for doing that. Uh, next to Katni and Hugo for the pilot work for the similar lines errors, primarily on the example code. Uh, and lastly, a, a, a hug to Riskable. It's a Discord uh, user who shared on the Show and Tell channel a cool Oreo shaped magnetic rotary input. And he explained how or why he needed two sensors to get the rotation direction. So thanks for that. Hmm. And it made me hungry all at the same time. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, K Match. All right, next up is Maker Melissa. Okay, how does my microphone sound now? It sounds good now. Oh, good. Uh, so I want to give a report to Lady Ada for the crash course on working with Linux device drivers. Uh, everyone who submitted new Blinka boards to get us up to 70. To Astronaut for taking the time to help narrow down what was causing the display noise issue on the BrainCraft hat. Uh, to you, Scott, for reading the Blinka notes and to group hug to everyone else. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. All right. Next up, I have notes from Mark Gambler. Uh, he says, Hug reports to Tanu for pointing out an obvious fix I need for CountIO and adding initializers to the PIO state machine. Group hug, because I'm probably forgetting someone from earlier this week. And microdev is not in it, so I'll read off microdev as well. Uh, microdev says, Hug report to Jerry N, AJS256, and Lady Ada for extensive testing of the RP2040 UART. Uh, hug report to Tan Newt for reviewing and providing constructive feedback on the URPR. And next up, uh, we have notes from Jose David, who says, Hug report to everybody. Thank uh, everybody for supporting each other. Hug report to Hugo for insightful ideas and willing to do things in the, uh, in the spot, like with the type annotations. And a hug report to Tan Newt and Foamy Guy for the learning experience during the streams. And with that, that's everyone. So uh, thank you all for hug reports. Uh, next up, we have a round robin, but this time it is for status updates. This is a chance for us to talk about what we've been working on, what we plan on working on in the coming week. Um, again, I will start and we'll go through the list. Um, it's a, my notes are already out of date a little bit. 
So I, uh, for myself, I got audio bus checked in and your is checked in as well. I had to do just a couple more corner cases on your it's, it's tough. Um, in my notes, I say, I'm hoping to knock out uh, rotary IO, but I've, I've handed that off to Jeff to do later this week and then do flash rework. Um, oh, I did say in the notes, flash rework may come sooner and it in fact will, uh, basically What's happening is that the RP2040 chips are being sent out to folks, and um, because the, those boards will have different flash chips on them, we need a better way to manage all of those different flash chips. In fact, um, over the weekend, Lady Ada was working on Feather RP2040s and put a 4 megabyte chip on that didn't work and then decided to switch to 8. So um, everybody can be thankful that the 4 megabyte didn't work because all, it looks like kind of the core... Uh, boards will come with eight megabytes instead of four uh, from Adafruit, which I think is generally better. It might add a little bit of cost, but uh, it's twice the space, so I think it's worth it. Um, yeah, so uh, I also forgot to say I'm out on Friday. I'm taking a three-day weekend, so I will not be around on Friday. Stream will be on Thursday, and so I'm hoping to make some progress on all this Flash stuff in that time. Okay. Um, next up, we have notes from TG Techie, who says, Last week, ramping up uh, for a small first batch of the TG Watch production, tested a new hot plate, posted a get notification once uh, TG Watch is on sale quiz on Twitter. Um, if you want to follow them on Twitter, they're at TG underscore Techie. Um, Commits a friend to try CircuitPython. Insert good intentioned villain <laughs> laughter. Please don't actually do that. <laughs> Um, integrated optional switching regulator into final rev of TG watch aligned screw holes with the rest reset button on the watch to remove an entry pointer for water um, next week test if the LSM 6 DSO library is compatible with the LSM 6 DSO X I C uh, bring the prototypes up to parity with a revision for TG watch test gasket maker with gray watch body and some inter internal restructuring to optimize for memory in the TG GUI app or API. And next up is V923Z. Uh, thanks, Scott. Um, so in the last couple of weeks, I've uh, continued work on, on MicroLab, fixed a number of smaller bugs, uh, added a couple of functions, um, sorted out uh, um, an NDNS problem. Um, someone was trying. Um, uh, to to Fourier transform uh, data from um, from an ABC and they got garbage and it turned out that all the bytes were swapped. Um, so I added a, a, a function with which you can uh, fix the NDNs. Um, but um, what's what's actually quite um, um, well, um, it's all consuming. Um, and in a sense, uh, is a is a new new module that I am trying to add to to Microlab, which um, um, would allow um, some sort of lazy loading uh, lazy loading of of um, um, huge amounts of data. So to put this in, in practical context, um, the the first request came from uh, OpenMV. They have these um, camera modules which produce. Um, uh, megabytes of data per frame, and the question was whether you can. Um, you can calculate anything on, on an image using Microlab if you can't possibly fit the data into RAM. And it, it turned out that it's possible. And in fact, the, the solution is embarrassingly simple. Um, but in any case, I, I have, to, have to implement it. So uh, with this new module, without breaking NumPy compatibility, um, you, you, you would be able to um, attach a function pointer to um, to a, a numerical array so um, your your array would would hold the um, the shape and the strides but no data whatsoever instead you would have a, a, a you could have a function pointer which fetches the data when it's needed and um, I think there are a couple of applications that um, could be interesting for circuit Python um, one is the the image processing that I have already mentioned. The second is that you could um, store or offload uh, data to an external storage device, uh, for example, an SPI RAM, um, um, and and it would would enable you to um, to work with uh, 
much more data than than what's actually what what, what actually could fit into into standard RAM. And um, a fun application could be um, 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 so the, the the data don't even have to reside in conventional RAM. Uh, it could even be um, pixels in a in, in a display. So what you could do in principle is attach your um, um, a function pointer, uh, fetch the data from the display, um, do whatever transformation you want to do on the data, and then push it back to the display. So if you say that, well, this image is too sharp for me, then you could, could simply pull in the data line by line, um, uh, uh, run a convolution on it, and push it back to the display. Um, uh, so this this is this is something that could be could be fun um, could be useful I don't know um, I I would actually be interested in in hearing some some suggestions opinions on on this subject so uh, in the coming weeks I'm trying to um, to finish the extension module and uh, once I'm done with that I I would like to roll out version version three awesome. I think I haven't even started thinking about cameras yet, so you're way ahead of the game there. Um, all right, let's go to the top. Thank you for the update. And next, next up is Dan. I'm scrolling. Hold on. Yeah, I was scrolling too. All right. Um, so I spent a lot of time last week. Um, there's a particular sensor, the, a color sensor, the TCS 74325 or 34, whatever the number is. And it works, it doesn't work on the RP2040. And there were several problems. One of them was that um, the RP2040 hardware doesn't support um, by, uh, writes, I2C writes of no data when it, there's just an address. So that's a problem. Uh, but eventually, I, I fixed a bunch of these bugs. Some of them haven't gone through the PR yet, PR system yet. But uh, it's still the case that this sensor works with Bitbang IO on the RP2040 and not with regular um, bus IO.i2c. And I do not understand why. And I'm probably just going to give up on this for now. Um, Somebody else saw a similar problem on a completely different board like six years ago with the same sensor. There's no, there are no errata or anything. I, I will just, it's not worth figuring this out further since there's a workaround. But I have a lot of background information now. Um, as we mentioned, uh, I talked to Jeff about um, speeding up translation builds. And we have some in the weeds discussion of that also, uh, mainly to try to, um, our, our build times continue to creep up because every time we add a new board or a new translation, it, it it's a product of boards times translations and it gets larger pretty quickly. So it'd be nice to figure out how to cut this down. Um, and I wrote up an issue with a proposal that may or may not make sense, but it it's sort of the motivation for it remains. Uh, I will start working on beta three release notes immediately after the meeting, and we can hope to get beta three out after we push a few PRs into the into the into the release or into main. And the other thing I'm going to work on is that I'll, I will be like the third or fourth or fifth person at least to start trying to debug what's wrong with I2C on ESP32 if you. It seems to interact with Wi-Fi badly and or it doesn't work when you do a soft reload. And there could be several reasons for these problems and I'm trying to, gonna try to narrow it down. Okay. Awesome, thanks, Dan. Okay, next up I have notes from David. It says, uh, testing audio on the Pico plus Pico demo, including playing with the RTTTL Christmas tune. Uh, using Circup for the first time, can we have the same thing for firmware upgrade? <laughs> Testing rotary encoder on QtPy. Making a MIDI version at Toddbot also made one. Using the Kibo Mini on a Pico using Pico to Zero adapter from Red Robotics. 
and non-CP acquired for my son the software FL Studio, a Belgian music program, and acquired a MIDI keyboard, MIDI keyboard my first MIDI thing since my Sound Blaster Pro. <laughs> nice. Uh, and next up is Foamy Guy. Hello. Uh, all right, Hello. status updates this week, um, or last week, I should say. I reviewed a couple PRs in display text for one for fixing the tab characters, one for adding a way to do vertical text. Um, and I also tested out an issue that came out of that second one uh, on the mag tag. I started working on uh, importing maps from Tiled, the game map editor software, to get those uh, maps to be able to import into CircuitPython code. Um, and I got last week also the bulk of the display text learn guide uh, down and out of my head onto the pages, uh, which is good. So this week, I'll be going back over that a few more times uh, with some editing passes and touching up um, all the final details. Uh, also this week, I will, um, if if the opportunity is there, um, I was going to say I would help out with the, the pilot PR. It sounds like maybe we might be another week or so out from that, but I'm definitely willing and interested to learn uh, what's going on there and help out if I can, uh, whenever I can. Um, other stuff this week is a couple final reviews on a few PRs uh, for display widgets, um, especially after that uh, pilot's taken care of, or, or if we take care of it on those specific libraries, that would work too, I think. Um, and then lastly, uh, the thing I want to get to this week as well is look into some more and document an issue that I found with TileGrid and palette transparency um, specifically inside of my Pi game display. It doesn't seem to affect uh, microcontrollers or even Blinka on the Raspberry Pi. So uh, I must have done something weird inside of my display that's making it draw some stuff kind of strange. So I'm going to get looked into that this week. That's all I got. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Filmy Guy. Uh, next up is Hire Effect. Uh, so this past week, uh, I worked on the SCM32 uh, low power module, um, though I got a little bit interrupted by some personal stuff, so I didn't get it done. But I did break out the uh, EXTI, which is the external interrupt, and uh, real time clock modules for the STM32. So those are good for STM. Those are going to be used in the low power, but are also kind of good to go for rotary, rotary IO and RTC after low power is done. Uh, might be easy to do those. Um, I did some low power testing, um, just uh, you know, kind of in the still in the intermediate early phases. Um, and uh, as a personal thing, I sold my first feather wing for CircuitPython. Uh, CircuitPython, so that's kind of fun. Um, this week, I'm going to be continuing my low power work um, and also running some ESP32 modules uh, under some more extensive tests uh, for some upcoming hardware. So that's um, what I have going on. And that's it. Nice. And you should link nice. us to your Featherwing as well. Oh, good. Totally. Yeah. It's for the, it's the, for my Dynamix, the Dynamixel motors, which hmm. are kind of a, a fancy brand of robot motor. So I'll also be doing some robotics kits for CircuitPython pretty soon, as soon as I finish up some 3D printed parts for them. Awesome. Yeah, definitely awesome. link yeah, us. Yeah, definitely link us. All right. Thank you. Next up is Hugo. Right, so uh, last week I wrapped up, or thought I did, the progress bar changes for vertical, um, but the duplicate code issue from Pylink uh, caught up, and this was samples, examples, documentation, all that good stuff, um, and did update cookie cutter to do the Pylink checks, brief a commit, um, the way we discussed uh, a lot of that. Um, this week, make uh, fixing an issue where the change I made to make Pylink work um, has called me out on something, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to look at a boot loop issue on the mag tag and um, an issue about customizing locales and layouts in HID. Awesome. That would be great. Thank you, Hugo. Uh, next up is Jeff Blair. Hello. Um, so last week, I worked on examples for PIO, and a number of those were added to the, um, what is it called, the, the Adafruit PIO ASM um, library. And I'm working on some guide text. I worked on the RGB matrix problems that Lamore encountered on the Pico, uh, like mostly on Thursday and Friday. And 
I, there were a number of red herrings, but finally this morning uh, I cracked one problem. But uh, so now it works for Lamore at all, which it didn't at first. Um, but she still saw a crash at least one time uh, running a script, updating files. So I'm going to go back and uh, test that some more before we merge it in. We'd really like for it to be solid rather than, you know, mostly OK. Uh, so uh, as for the PIO examples, the goal is to send the guide to be published this week. Even if it's short, like it just has one or two fully explained examples, the more testing of the RGB matrix on RP2 that I mentioned. And um, we talked in the internal meeting, and Scott and Lamore thought it would be good if I started work on the rotary IO for the Raspberry Pico. And a part of that is that I plan to add a some kind of way that you can run a PIO program that accepts input and check whether there's input waiting for you without blocking, um, which would be useful for a variety of reasons, not least of which so that I can start prototyping the rotary IO decoder purely in Python. And as for fun stuff, my uh, WWVB receiver using CircuitPython now works very reliably. Um, it needed a combination of like uh, bypass capacitors, but also just not to be too near my real desktop computer. Um, time zone correction works now. Um, and in theory, then this would follow future US daylight time rule changes because it gets the information in the broadcast. Uh, it just needs a display. So I'm looking at all of the uh, eight segment displays from Adafruit, and I'm going to pick something up probably this week. Uh, so that's kind of my project that I'm continuing with when I'm not working, working. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. All right, next up is Jerry. Yeah, hi. Um, so did a bunch of testing with the uh, this issue of the LC709203F battery, um, what, do you, what do you call it, battery information <laughs> board. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it doesn't work on the NRF52840. And uh, it's a, sort of a known issue that's been out there for a while. So I tried, so, um, <laughs> tried um, um, getting some screenshots of some um, logic analyzer probes of it, but it, you know, and I got some, but I, they don't make a lot of sense to me. So I don't know if anybody else has been looking into this, but anybody wants there are all the issues out there and the stuff's on there, and any suggestions about what to do with it? <laughs> it's a um, it's, nothing jumped out to me as to what the problem is, other than it doesn't work and it looks different, but um, it. it it's not clear that it looks bad. Um, you know, the decoding of the um, of the exchanges looks looks reasonable, hmm. but so something something's weird. Um, and let's see, but and it's also intermittent. Like I found some situations where when I do things, all of a sudden the problem would go away briefly, but then it would come back. So it's, it's it seems to be there most of the time. And on most NRF fifty two eight forty boards, the clue was really bad. Um, the sense is the one that I got working for a while, but then it broke again. Um, so, um, and then they spent a bunch of time playing with the UART stuff on the Pico with the GPS. Thanks for getting that in there. And then uh, there was another issue that came up on on the forums that people were finding that if you took a GPS and put it on, a feather wing and put it on an STM thirty two F four hundred five, it didn't work. It, it wouldn't wouldn't get a fix. It seemed really odd that you know it would it would work on other boards but not on that one. And I was able to reproduce it, um, and it turns out from my testing anyway, it looks like it's the proximity of the antenna, not necessarily the GPS itself. So when I used an external antenna, it was fine. Um, but if I took if I took the external antenna and stuck it right on top of the thirty two F four hundred five, it stopped working. It it lost a fix. So something's emitting from that board that the, the, the um, uh, GPS antenna doesn't like. So again, that's documented in the uh, in the, a forum post. And yeah, just to keep myself busy. I've been I've gotten really frustrated with a just a, a a really common thing of my Linux box crashing whenever I disconnect USB Circuit Python boards from it lately. Um, the NRF52840 has been really bad at it, but all the boards have been doing it to me. So I've been moving everything back over to my my Raspberry Pi 400, uh, which 
maybe a little slower, but it's been really stable. So there's my new, uh, my new Circuit Python home. There's yep. an issue for that, right? I believe so. There's been one out for a long time. Yeah. I should go back and look at it, but it, you know, it's one of these things that comes and goes, uh, but it's, it, and Dan had checked it out. It seems to be a pretty clear Linux kernel issue that they don't care about. We should, oh, uh, we could ask TAC to look at it if he hasn't yet. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I don't have a lot of information. It's just, you know, it's frustrating because sometimes it'll work fine. And other times it's just every time I disconnect, I had to wait for the machine. The machine just reboots. <laughs> Yeah. So, and it's, it's the fun not, stuff. I uh, finally I got my bird cam out. We noticed some bluebirds, a lot of bluebird activity in the yard, and they've been looking into into various bird feeders. So I quickly got my bird cam out to see if we can entice the bluebirds into it. Mm -hmm. And um, been doing a lot of playing with the Home Assistant on a Raspberry Pi four, um, setting up a local MQTT broker, which has been a lot of fun to, to play with. So, that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. And yeah, if, if yeah, it yeah. sounds like Carter has had this Carter's USB had issue too, so USB. it's probably something we need to figure out what the the common hardware is and then ask TAC to look at it. It's not it's not TAC, it's not a tiny USB. It's like I tracked it down to a kernel thing. But why is it only on some builds? Like I don't have this problem. Well, uh yeah, well, it's only it only happens on Ubuntu, as far as I can tell, or, or maybe on other, or at least Ubuntu's with that particular kernel, maybe. But you know, it's, I don't know. It doesn't happen on a Raspberry Pi at all. Yeah, I think it has to do with timing, also, and just the details of the drivers. But you know, I tracked it down to I've tracked it down to various things that the kernel sees, which the kernel should be upset about, and the response I get on the kernel mailing list is on the USB mailing list is like, that's not our problem. You shouldn't do that. Don't do that yet. <laughs> so I think there were some ameliorations that we can do, but basically the whole idea of a drive disappearing and reappearing is like, we are not gonna handle that. But I don't get why I've never seen this. Like I've, I've been running Linux for a month or two now and I haven't had this problem at all. Like I, I don't know. It, it may have, it, yes. I. That's it may weird have to me. To, it may have to do when, when something goes wrong it, to certain drivers to decide whether whether they're 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 more robust or not, and right. so it may have to do with the AMD motherboard support. Right. But yeah. All right. Well, that's a bummer. I'll, I can talk to you more about it. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. Happy with my USB ports. Okay, let's keep going. That's in the weeds territory. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. I'm glad we had that issue, at least. Um, OK, I've got notes from Jose. Jose says, um, last week, PR for the tab detection for label and bitmap label, uh, PR for vertical label, and PR to uh, sample type annotations. This week, going to go back to peripheral for the Pico and open to Python requests or others. If you teach me, I'm willing to learn. Ooh, that's good. And next up is Katni. All right, so last week I uh, did some new product stuff for the TPS 62827. Uh, it doesn't require a guide, but we added the um, info for the product into the um, actual product entry in the shop. So if you pick one of those up, there's info there. Um, did an update to the guide for the BMP388 for the STEMIQT revision of the breakout. Um, thanks to Hugo again. Um, for sorting out the pylint and pre-commit and sorting out getting pylint to run the way that I needed it to to stop um, duplicate code checking the examples. I started the guide for uh, the BLM uh, kit. It is a board that Adafruit designed and will be donating to um, groups for workshops. And so we're going to put a guide together for that and started working on the CircuitPython examples for it and uh, spent more time last week working with Anne on picking up the Python for microcontrollers newsletter. Uh, this week, continue the BLM guide, um, help folks with their PRs regarding the PyLint fix. Uh, Foamy guy, I will definitely take you up 
on your offer to help out with that. And um, I will uh, make sure that Dylan reaches out to you because it would be excellent to have more than one person who can run these patches. So um, I will uh, have him reach out to you when he actually does that so you can see that process as well. Um, and then I'm going to be working on the guide for the Feather RP2040, which will be in the shop soon, spoiler, um, and continue working with Anne on the newsletter. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. All right. Next up is KMatch98. Okay. So continued work on graphical widgets uh, this week. Uh, so I updated the documentation on the widget and control classes to support those widgets. Particularly thanks uh, for the feedback, and I incorporated that into the most recent PR. Uh, also, a related note is uh, how to document those classes. So I explored how Sphinx can draw inheritance graphs, and I need to test that in the build system to see if it also works there as, as it does on my machine. Uh, next, um, I created a new module for holding any bitmap manipulation tools uh, called bitmap tools. Uh, and it has a first a rotation and zoom scale function as its first entry into that and a placeholder for anybody else to add new bitmap related features. Um, next, I uh, created or updated the blit function uh, and incorporated several errors in the process, but I think those are fixed now. Uh, basically, so if you're trying to scroll something, you can safely do that in any direction inside of your own bitmap. And I needed that so I could create a scrolling text box widget. Uh, and then last thing from this past week is there was an issue on the bitmap saver uh, function where you can save from your screen to a file, bitmap file. Um, and it, it showed a feature of the core function, which is got exposed, I think, for this, this function. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that function doesn't copy unowned pixels i think that's probably how it's supposed to work in the core uh but it basically it, it doesn't rewrite into your buffer over previous pixels if there's nothing there so i think that's how it's supposed to work in the core but it just caused uh, a little issue with the bitmap saver so hmm. uh if you think it shouldn't work that way let me know and i'll take a look at it but i think uh, there's an easy solution just in the bitmap saver library to refresh your buffer or reset it so yeah, I was, uh, I was, it, I, I guess I would assume it would just do the black if no pixel was found. It, I think it doesn't write anything mm. if there no a group owns it. Right. So basically, it leaves whatever in the buffer was there. So it left streaks, sort yeah. of for what, what the last row was. So I think the cord needs it to be that way. But I think when you exposed it, that bitmap saver really wanted to write black. So, mm. so I solved it just by refreshing the buffer in the bitmap saver library so that. It zeroes out everything okay. as a first solution. So, okay. but if you don't think that's how it's supposed to work, let me know and I'll take a look. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, upcoming. So, um, uh, again, the continuation of widget work. Uh, I want to get the switch uh, submitted for a PR, and particularly, I want to get a good set of documentation on how that works, so that that uh, 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 other folks may be able to follow that uh, sort of example and, and make more widgets. I want to look at the progress bar PR from, from Hugo. Uh, also want to update my dial widget with uh, the latest class class functions, another annotation widget, uh, and also a scrolling text box with scrolling buttons. And then last, I want to add one more bitmap tool with a fill region. Uh, currently, there's a, a fill tool to fill a full bitmap, but not a pretty small region. So mm. I want to add that as well. Neat. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Kmatch. All right, next up is Maker Melissa. Uh, hello. So last week, I spent a good chunk of the week hacking on the Mini Pi TFT display driver so that a single driver would work with uh, each of the three ST7789 displays along with rotation and offsets. And I updated the Pi TFT script to be more flexible with the different rotation settings uh, with different displays uh, using the power of Python. Uh, I implemented the offset logic that I had um, developed during that into back into our Arduino library, so it's much cleaner to work with. Um, I updated the Raspberry Pi fan service script to make use of the built-in fan service on Raspberry Pi boards, but on other ones, it'll use the existing method it was using before. 
Uh, I updated the circuitpython.org website with more Blinka boards, bringing us up to 70. And I started diving into a conflict between the BrainCraft audio driver and the BrainCraft display. Um, this week I'll continue looking at that, and then I need to uh, look into memory issues on portal base with the matrix portal. Uh, I wanted to update the libgpiod pulse in on Blinka to load either like a 32 or 64 bit compiled version, depending on the Raspberry Pi OS version. Uh, I wanted to add a matrix portal display rotation option, and uh, I've been meaning to add a magtag Wi Fi enable option for a while. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. All right, next up is no, there are notes from Mark, who says, Last week, fix in, fixed slash submitted Count.io for the RP2040. This week, we'll try to get Parallel Bus for the RP2040 done, but life got in my way. And that's it for status updates. Thank you, everyone. Um, next up, we have our final section, which is in the weeds. So in the weeds is a chance for us to just talk about whatever uh, we need to talk about. That might be a longer discussion. Um, So the way this works is that uh, folks have put topics in here uh, previously with their name, and we'll kind of just go down the list of topics. Um, So first up, we have Dan and Jeff. So um, I'll take this topic up if Dan doesn't mind. Uh, so, as Dan talked about during his status updates, he's looking at some ways that actually during the build process for a given number of translations, we can hopefully speed things up. Uh, but I was looking at our translation statistics, and another thing that we can do is stop building certain translations. And I'll kind of take these in order from how clear cut to how debatable I think it is. Um, there are two translations that were requested on WebLate, and we added them, but zero translations have actually been made. So if you download either the Hindi or the Greek builds, they're labeled as such, it just comes up fully in English. Mm-hmm. I think that we should probably stop publishing those. They are not helping people. They're actively, um, well, they're not helping people. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next category, um, is translations that are uh, have only a few messages out of the out of the whole and are not seeing active work. So this would include potentially the Czech translation and the Korean translation, which are three and seven percent translated. And then finally, there is a translation that exists more or less just for monolingual English people to be able to check whether the translation machinery works, and it's called the pirate translation. You know, I think it adds things like R in the middle of uh, messages just for fun. And I think that we could remove that from uh, the official builds without, you know, harming the ability of any of any person to use CircuitPython. Um, so if we remove those uh, five translations, that I believe reduces the number of translations by about a third and would make a pretty big difference in the build time, a pretty big favorable difference. Um, And then before I take uh, comments on that, I want to say, I mentioned we have these two translations with zero messages actually translated. Um, WebLate has a very nice feature where someone can request that a translation be added. Um, However, there's no way to communicate back to that person. So we've made a change on WebLate that instead of being able to request it there, they're directed to our existing pull request about adding a language. And now we have told them, you know, add a new issue on GitHub about the language you want. And then we have an open uh, communication channel with these uh, people. And so for instance, there was recently a very strange um, kind of African regional language requested And it turned out because the person later came and talked to us on uh, Discord that they were looking for a British English translation. And this is an example of, we couldn't resolve this uh, using what we had on WebLate and that's why uh, changing the process so they would request a fresh translation by an issue on GitHub is gonna help things. Um, And I don't know whether we will choose to add a 
British English translation, but it might go great with the raspberry pie pico kind of as a, as two flavors that go together. So with that, um, I'm done with the exposition and I'm happy to hear comments. I want to just say, um, somebody asked this morning about which of these trans, um, hex that asked, is somebody actually using the pin with pinion translation? And so it turns out that without the not much work at all, I was able to look at the download counts for the downloads from various languages. And I have the January data. And what I see is that for translations that are unused, there's usually like around a thousand downloads or there was in January. And then for translations that are used, it goes up from there. So probably some translations are being downloaded. Auto everything is being downloaded automatically. Like maybe some people are just downloading everything. We're not, I'm not really sure why. But that's what we see in the server, the HTTP server log. But what I did see, for instance, is that the pirate translation actually has only 2,000 downloads. Unlike, uh, say, the, Hindi, the empty Hindi one, which had about 1,000. So 1,000 seems to be like the. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can, it goes up from there. Like English is like almost 50,000. So. Um, and the pinion one was also had a noticeable number of downloads. So it was not like nobody was using. So this is kind of an easy way to tell, like, are these translations interesting or not to anybody? Right. Um, so I don't know what it says about the pirate translation. That's kind of a just, but. Um, I think. Um... I think it's obvious that Greek and Hindi could be turned off in builds. Like clearly if we shouldn't advertise them as such, if there's like literally nothing that's been translated. Yeah. I think percentage is not necessarily the best measure, but I think what we should get out of this is like a, like, okay, here's the bar, right? Like this is the point that a translation is, is turned on that we actually care about and that we build. Um, and I think that bar is actually like, what we need to do is we actually, I don't know if Weblate has a way to do this, but we should really flag like all of the core messages as core things, right? Like all the prompts and things that you get. And then in terms of error messages, like we could just do error messages as like a percentage, but like there is this core set of, of translation of, of messages that like we should really point people to is like, these are the core ones that we need before we start giving it out, which is exactly the experience you're talking about, Jeff, of like you download it and the prompts you get should be in your native language. <laughs> right. right. Um, yeah. And sorry, go ahead. No, I was like, that's what I think. I think, I think if we, if we pick a core set and then if, if we could get that in web of like, here's the ones that are like the baseline and then everything else is on top of that as a bonus. Hugo, were you starting to speak? I thought I heard somebody else. No. All right, I must have just imagined it. Uh, so Hugo had said, though, in the voice channel, is there a web late option to be notified when new translations are needed? Unfortunately, I don't think that there is. Um, and then I'll also read some comments that David left in the notes document. Um, he says, uh, in response to don't build the pirate translation, uh, just when PyMoroni starts to embrace CircuitPython, you want to do that, really? <laughs> Um, and I mean, I, I see it's a fun, it's a fun connection. Um, but you know, for me, I'm, I'm happy to see pirate translation remain, but for me, translations are about helping people, uh, making it available to people who, uh, don't speak English and need it in another language. And I don't see the pirate translation as, as useful, but we don't have to be joyless either. Um, and David also comments, alternative, uh, don't build all translations for every pull request, but only for release. And I think that the reason we need to build it for every pull request is we will discover, oh, this pull request is full, but right. only for a particular language. Right. And some months that language is German, some months that language is Japanese. On Fridays, it's French. We don't know why, they all just have slightly different uh, characteristics when you bring different um, configuration options into it and this and that. So um, I think there's a reason that CI builds everything every time, because when you try to short circuit that, 
you will end up surprised that a configuration you expected to work doesn't work at the time you're doing a release. And that's exactly what CI is for avoiding. Uh, I fully understand the CI, but um, I mean, if you test one release out of 10, well, one PR out of 10, or if you test for space only on the place where you know it's going to break, because this is a place where we are very tight, you can have the benefit of detecting those problems without having to compile for each and every PR. I just, I don't think you have a good enough gauge on what that is. I, I don't think you want to do that. I think you, if you, you always want to build what you want to release. Um, otherwise, releases, be, like releases are already taxing to do. And if we end up adding this, like, if we don't detect these early problems and have further problems at release time, like, that's just going to make it harder to release. Like, the cost we're talking about here is, like, Microsoft is paying for CI time and we have to wait a little longer. Like, I, I would much rather wait a little longer every time than have to worry about, like, issues popping up only at release time. Well, it's also the motivation for, like, can we speed up the CI? How can we speed up CI? Right. Uh, and, and so that was like the translation stuff. So I think that that, I, I agree that, I agree with Scott that you don't know you have a problem until you try it. And that's the whole point of CI. So um, I, I don't mind spending the time on that because it is, it, it, for instance, it may be that the NRF build has a lot of French BLE messages, but mm -hmm. there aren't, aren't a lot of German BLE messages or something. It's not consistent across boards or ports or, or languages necessarily. So. so my proposal would be, let's start by turning Hindi and Greek and Czech and Korean off, except and let's establish a baseline of like this set of messages must be 100% and then everything on top of that is a bonus in terms of like, you know, like when somebody comes to me like, oh, I want to do set for like whatever translation, we can say like, start with this set, get that set 100%. And then all of these other ones are, are, are a bonus. And that would be, would, would you be willing to make up that list of what those are? I assume it would be things like what you see when your program runs, when your program finishes, when you enter the REPL, when you type help. Right. I mean, and... we, could, we could probably simplify it by just saying, main.c anything from main.c okay it, it would be that set. I, I will look whether i think that you could like do a search for that on weblight mm -hmm. um yeah i can look into that um and i can also make a pull request so that the translations to be done are maintained in the uh the github yaml files for the CI, does that make sense, or should it be in the scripts, in the in the tools folder, or whatever that is? Uh, there is some place that reads the locale directory to figure out all of them. And do we want? Uh, I think it's build board info, maybe. Do we want a uh, a block list or an allow list for that? I wonder if we could actually do it automatically, like actually just look at all of the translations that from main.c and only pass them through. Maybe that's too hard. Let's do the simple thing first. Yeah. I would do an allow list. Okay. Because a uh, block list won't handle new translations well. All right. I will do a PR for an allow list. And I would appreciate it if you would write up what we want kind of as a baseline. And then we can reevaluate the Czech and Korean I suspect based off of that, because it's possible that that's exactly what one right. or the other of them did. Right. The other option is it starts with every message that started with A in English, and that's not as good. Right. <laughs> and I suspect Hugo will have a good feel for this too, because I think they were thinking they were looking at um, the help text is actually like n not something we translate well uh, because it's uh, not hooked up. I don't think because it's a multi-line sure. thing and we don't handle that. I think we either had a discussion or there's an issue about actually being able to translate the help text and we, we should figure that out. That would be yeah, good. this does seem familiar. Do you mean the doc strings? 
No, not the doc strings. The just like if you type help parentheses in. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we had kind of discussed that. Briefly. Right. We had talked about like putting a placeholder in the code, and then that placeholder would be what, like the the source string that gets translated. Right. Yep. Um, but I think I think in general, like having a policy around this would help new translations as well. Of like, okay, start here. Right. Like right now, it's kind of just like, congratulations. Here's all these random error strings. Um, and so if we could if we get better tier our translations on what to do and then use that as a policy for inclusion, I think that would help everybody. But yeah, let's, let's see how far we get, how much we gain back from just turning Hindi and Greek off as well. Like I think pirate's fun and it's already there. So it's like not a lot of cost to leave on. Um, all right. I put all that in the notes. We have our action items, so I think it's time to hand it to the next person. All right, let's hand it off to V923Z. Uh, thanks, Scott. So I, I think uh, Jeff has probably uh, already answered my question. The, the question was, um, if it's safe to um, to rely on the garbage collector if you have, uh, um, well, basically circularly reference referenced objects. Mm -hmm. So um, I have an example here. I, I stripped it from from the um, original code. So there's no guarantee that it works, but it should display the the, the idea. Um, there's a there's a pointer to to object A in object B, um, and vice versa. And and what what happens with the with the um, uh, garbage collection um, in such a case. Um, is it okay if I have um, uh, such a construct in my code, or is is, is it is it absolutely not safe? Um, that that was basically the gist of the question. And I I I just would like to ask Jeff and then to confirm that this is this is okay. Um, he, he linked a, a Wikipedia article. But uh, he he didn't actually say anything about mm -hmm. whether this applies to MicroPython or CircuitPython. Okay, thanks, Dan. Well, then I am done. Great breaking news. Dan says that yes, we use okay. uh, Mark and Sweep garbage collection. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So so the the stuff that's in the notes that people are saying is that Jeff said it's a Mark and Sweep garbage collection collection that handles circular references without difficulty with a link to the Wikipedia article. And then uh, V923Z was asking, like, is that what we use in CircuitPython and MicroPython? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes. Um, right, OK, thanks. I would encourage you not to do that, simply okay. because I think it makes it confusing about ownership. Um, I think it, I think ha having circular references makes it harder to track ownership uh, within C code. Um, that's 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 correct. Yeah, um, I agree with that. More for humans than for the software. Correct is what you're saying, Scott. Okay, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, yeah. I, 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 I can, so this is this is actually a convenience issue because um, um, if, if I if I want to implement the um, this um, um, uh, extra uh, uh, module, then um, um, and this in this new construct where I have the the um, header and the function pointer, I still have to store somewhere uh, the um, a, a reference or or the the properties of the of of the original and and the array. Um, so the the easiest way for me is if if I simply link the the original and the array. Um, uh, the, if you if you say that that's not not very elegant, then I can. I can simply copy the um, copy the header by hand, and uh, that's that's not such a big issue. So if you if you say that that's that, that that shouldn't be in any code, then then I can I can I can go the other way. That's that's absolutely no problem. I I, I think it's fine to have back pointers. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. I, I I don't think I think if if you, if you need them, you need them. And, no, no I, I did, I did, the 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 uh, mm -hmm. the word need is a is a very uh, well loaded one because I 
I don't actually need it. It's it's convenient, but uh, there are other ways. So, um, but if it takes more space or something, I would take, say it, take, it takes 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 more space and um, right. And uh, so you you have to copy them things. Uh, in this case, you can just pass the pointer and then then you are done. Yeah, if if it's I mean, yeah. The problem is if if you eventually, especially in C code that doesn't have garbage collection, it can be a bit of a nightmare if you need to. So, so one, okay, but one one reason I I, I actually uh, for this was that if you if you later uh, change the um, the uh, header or or um, the the um, type definition of the end array, then uh, if you use a pointer, then it's automatically updated in the in the code. If you copy things. Then you have to make sure that you copy things. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, I, I, I see your point, Scott. So uh, I, I've, I mean, I think I, I, I can be convinced. I mean, I'm I'm not saying don't do it. I, I I guess this is the point where I would expect you to have at least a comment saying like, okay. what, how they're related, how mm -hmm. one implies that the other is still around, and like. This is why Rust is interesting, right? Like, Rust is interesting because they formalize, like, ownership. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would just, like, just add a comment. Like, I'm not saying don't do it at all. I just think, like, it can be unclear sometimes. Okay. And I, I think that's fair enough. Yeah. I, tr I, I trust you to make that judgment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Excellent. I, I mean, I, when, I, when I was writing GUI toolkits, the parent would have pointer to the children and the children might have pointers to the parent. Right. For right. Exactly. Okay. So yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's similar. Right. Yeah. But like one of those things implies ownership and one of them doesn't. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Right. Right. And so exactly. like, just, just being able to say that of like, this will disappear when this other thing disappears, that sort of thing. Right. Okay. Thanks a lot. Mm hmm. Uh, and in circuit Python, in circuit Python and micro Python, it's about like which, which one gets pointed to by a root pointer, for example. I heard somebody else. I was waiting for my turn. <laughs> okay. Well, it's your turn now, so go ahead. Um, so there are three boards that um, work with an RP2040, and I have a Raspberry Pi Zero kind of size. Mm -hmm. One exists. Uh, from Red Robotics, and that's the one I'm playing with. There is one from Adafruit um, in the top secret, and there is one from Arturo. Um, and I'm pretty sure they're not going to have the same pinouts, uh, mapping the same RP2040 to pins from Raspberry Pi stuff. Yep. Um, and I would love to write code that work for the tree. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I've, maybe I've never used Blinka with a Raspberry Pi Zero, but I guess there is a name for each pin in Blinka side. And if that name is also working in CircuitPython on the RP2040, one of those three ways, then the mm -hmm. same code will work on the four possible stuff. Right. And I don't know to get to that point. <laughs> I mean, that's and... that's exactly the the right intuition, I think, and something that I've kind of started realizing I need to hound people on. <laughs> it's like your board defines your pin names, not the chip itself. Um, I was pushing Unexpected Maker about this bunch, actually. And so I think you're exactly right. Um, and I, I think you're exactly right as well to... To we should look at the pin naming in the board module that's used in Blinka for the Pi Zero, and then either we have board definitions in Circuit Python that do the mapping between those names and the RP twenty forty names, or we um, have a library that does it instead. And this is the the weird zone that we are in right now with the like module carrier board relationship versus like board board stuff. Then does that look like the physical feather pin from um, Pimaroni that we were not super happy with? Or um... it 
No, I don't think it looks like that. They were, I think with the issue there was that they were picking a new numbering, <laughs> right? Like they did a feather board, yeah. but then they decided to name them all different names. Um, and so I think the right way to go about it is like, and Lamore was talking about this last night in her, um, in her, I want to say deep dive, but her desk of Lady Ada was like, at some point, if you, you build a board, it's the first of its form factor, you pick all the names, but the second board you make should just have the same names. Like, regardless of whether the pin numbers actually match or not, like, you should still call every pin by the same name. And I think that was the problem with the Pimeroni stuff is like, I think their physical pin stuff was like trying to like renumber it from one again. And it's like, no, mm-hmm. just call it the name that we already call it standardly. Uh, the, the, there, are, there, is, uh, there is something with a cutie pie and the Xiaomi, which yeah, I wanted to port something from the cutie pie to the Xiaomi. And I was ready to rename the port number and it was magically working. So I was like, oh, great. <laughs> so they're the same. Same size, same pin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's how it should be. I actually applied to do a presentation at the open hardware summit this year for that i was like i know what i could talk about for 20 minutes <laughs> like name the pins the same please like when you design a board um, what, what i'm gonna do is use the name from the board i have maybe make a table and then whenever there is something um migrate to that um, i think that's the easiest for me <laughs> Yeah, I I think I know Artero has a table. Oh yes, he made a mapping of all the pin usage. Right. Yeah, but he wanted to know where I two C was, where SPI was, and stuff like that. Right. Um. And mm, yeah. I mean, I I think you're right. You like see what Blinka does on the Pi Zero, <laughs> and start there. Yeah, that that would be the right naming. Uh, right. Okay. Yep, that's what I think. And I mean, the benefit of the fact that the Pi Zero doesn't label any of those forty pins means that you could call it whatever you want. <laughs> you don't have to worry about mismatching with with what the silk screen says because there's no helpful sil- silk screen on those. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think you're. I think you're exactly right, David. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, last up is Hugo. Um, just since we we're talking about those pilot uh, updates earlier, especially with uh, Dylan going through and applying that change to each repository, it occurred to me that um, any pull request out there would still fail because the check on GitHub Actions happens on the branch again uh, that the pull request is on and not a merged version with that's uh, target I, I don't think that's true actually so i just had somebody update um build.yaml and uh, pre-commit config.yaml on uh, an active pr and it did run everything properly Um, what I was thinking is if someone updates it on the main branch, um, mm-hmm. will the PR execution uh, pass? Or will it... Oh, no, it still has to be pulled into the PR, I think. So I think it, it, it depends. I think GitHub Actions does run on a PR uh, on the merge commit into the main uh, branch that it's being proposed for. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is that if if it runs and it fails and then you don't update the PR again, it doesn't like try with the newer version of like main. It doesn't do it again with the new merge. So there like one way that Katni's talking about is like, you could just merge into the branch and then it will, you know, for sure that you're using the latest one. Or if you just, I think put a push another commit to that branch, like if there's other work to do, like I think that will cause it to happen as well. It's not very clear. Um no, but I think that this I I do think that there are going to be situations where folks are going to have to pull the changes into the PR. 
And so I think having a document, which is what we discussed here, having just a document that has an explanation of how to do that is not a bad idea. Um, Because when we run into that, we can say, hey, we've already got this documented. You know, here's exactly what to do. Um, And that'll help folks out, um, I think, just in the event that this does happen that way. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it you're right, it depends. There are times when a PR, um, you can rerun the code as many times as you want, and it still only runs it from a previous yeah. uh, point. It's and weird. so, you, yeah, it's, it, 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 exactly. So I think, I think um, Hugo, if you're willing to write up, uh, and I think Markdown probably makes the most sense, um, because then you can have, you know, text and code uh, mixed together. Um, if you want to write up a document that, you know that quickly explains how to do that i would really appreciate it and you can post it to um tag me and post it in the circuit python channel and then um we'll have that available okay sounds reasonable and um scott to your point since it doesn't rerun the github actions i'll add a little blurb in there just how to make uh, essentially an empty commit just to it's like a touch on the pull request so that it will be triggered i think i would just just do the merge manually into the branch um, yeah. Instead of just doing an empty commit, just just do the merge, dr- and then you know for sure that it's merged in. Okay, sounds good. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, let's wrap up. We're we're full our through our full ninety minutes here. Um, okay, this has been the Circuit Python Weekly meeting for March first, twenty twenty one. Thank you all for stopping by and participating. Uh, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, uh, those of us, uh, there are a number of us that work on CircuitPython uh, who are paid by Adafruit. Consider purchasing uh, from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. Um, the video of the meeting will re- be released on the Adafruit YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available shortly thereafter. Um, the newsletter will also feature a link to this, uh, so you can subscribe to that by going to adafruitdaily.com. Check the box for Python for microcontrollers. Uh, the next meeting will be a Monday, next Monday, I believe. Yes. Um, at the normal time of 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern here on the Adafruit Discord server. You're welcome to join by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. We're there all week. Um, if you want to get notified about the meeting or uh, participate up and, and speak at the meeting, uh, please ask any of us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. Uh, your, your name will turn purple if you don't have any other roles that are higher than it. And uh, with that, thank you all so much for being so awesome. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone.